Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman and it's time for your weekly wrap up and I want to begin first as we always do by thanking our newest supporters on the channel and we've got three new monthly members who are contributing to our donor box page, Matthew Martin, Randy Hunsaker, and Adam Cuphalt. And you can also help the channel by going to lon.tv slash support if you want to join them. I want to thank everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and everyone who watches on an ongoing basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. Now we don't have an advertiser this week, but we do have a non-ad, an affiliate link for gearvest.com because they've got a, a flash sale page that I wasn't aware of where they, uh, every couple of days, add a whole bunch of new and unique and obscure gadgets and uh, sell them at pretty steep discounts. So you can check out that link there. It's an affiliate link to uh, see what they're offering today. They've always got something on the horizon and you can get a preview of that by clicking on the coming soon tab. Now last week I uploaded a bunch of stuff to the extras channel. This week I uploaded nothing but I will have a video up probably a little later this morning that you might see uh, when you log into YouTube this evening. So we'll probably do more on the extras channel now that I caught up and shot everything on the main channel that I unboxed on the extras channel. So uh, be on the lookout for more content there. On the main channel, we looked at a whole bunch of different stuff. My most popular video of the week was the Xbox versus the NVIDIA Shield uh, video. And as expected, I got some good feedback from all of you. So I'm probably going to do a follow-up soon uh, comparing Plex on both platforms because we didn't look at Plex. I don't usually use Plex for playing back my Blu-ray movies inside the house. I usually use it as an out-of-the-house kind of thing. But I'm going to look at that on both platforms and see which one does better. Uh, so that will be coming up maybe this week or early next. Uh, we also looked at a way to watch Plex in virtual reality for our monthly sponsored post from Plex, which was pretty cool. Uh, we looked at a TechLast notebook from GearBest. It's a $500 device, two-in-one with a Core M3. Really cool device. Not a lot of you watched that one, so if you like my reviews of PCs, uh, definitely check that out in the master playlist down below. We also got a look at a new keyboard from Cherry using their new Silent MX Red switches, and I compared that to how the regular MX Red switches sound. And I love mechanical keyboards because I remember growing up with these old typewriters that had these really satisfying key presses, and it's so cool to see mechanical keyboards get back into fashion once again. So it's always fun to uh, review those on the channel, even if they don't get a huge viewership. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind, and this is week 47 of me doing this as a full-time occupation. We're getting very close to the one-year mark. I believe I started sometime in March last year, and uh, we're still in business, which is a great thing. And speaking of business, I wanted to just talk about uh, some frustrations that I have related to YouTube and selling advertising on the platform. And as you all know, we've been dealing with this demonetization stuff, the adpocalypse, and all these other things going on. And uh, my opinion is, is that, you know what, if these are problems for you as a YouTube creator, then sell your own ads. As you start getting larger, you, you should have some value perhaps to advertisers. And of course, we do uh, ads that appear as sponsored videos here on the channel. But I, I realize I can't just do that all the time because we turn ourselves into an infomercial. So I try to limit them to uh, one a week, maybe two a week at the most. And that, of course, now uh, limits my available inventory. So one of the things I've been exploring is uh, selling pre-roll advertising, you know, the regular YouTube ads that you see all the time. And one of the things that boggles the mind here is that, uh, you know, of course, AdWords is really the bread and butter for Google for making YouTube work. And they really don't re help at all uh, giving us creators the tools we need to understand the AdWords platform and sell ads appropriately to uh, clients of ours. I've been trying to do a couple of ad campaigns. You might have seen one that I did for the Mocha Foundation. And I want to do more of that, but I can't get support. You you know, my YouTube contact is strictly on the creator side. He has no real ability to get me in touch with anyone on the AdWords side of the business. And I think YouTube creators ourselves uh, could actually be very good salespeople for the platform because there are times when uh, doing a sponsored video or dropping in some kind of on-air read is not as appropriate or effective as a pre-roll ad might be. And I think one of the things YouTube could really do to strengthen themselves on, as a platform is to uh, really tie us in better with their advertising sales. So if anyone from YouTube is watching, that's my suggestion. And that's why I'm bringing it up here during the wrap up because I do think it would help people out quite a bit and help the platform. And I'm also contemplating contemplating doing a little more traveling this year because I really did enjoy doing the CES coverage, those dispatches, and it looks like a lot of you subscribers like them as well. And uh, one of the things that I'm looking at doing next is heading down to Florida to cover the launch of the 
Falcon Heavy rocket. Now, don't worry, we're not going to turn this into a space channel. I think I might launch a separate effort at some point to do that. But uh, this is something I think that might be kind of a fun diversion every once in a while. This is a, a very high-tech piece of rocketry that I think might change a lot in how we look at space and how we access space. And we did cover a SpaceX launch about two or three years ago here on the channel. I'll put a link to those uh, videos down below on the uh, description there so you can check them out. And I'm thinking about doing something kind of similar to that uh, because this rocket is either going to explode, as Elon Musk says, or uh, they'll do something really cool, which is return all three of its boosters that you can see there uh, back to the ground. Two of them will land near the launch site where we should be able to see them come in. And uh, the third one is going to land on a barge in the ocean. And what's unique about this rocket is that it can carry a lot of weight. In fact, if it's successful and they're able to get this thing up and running, uh, we'll be able to bring uh, 63,800 kilograms to low Earth orbit. That's about 70 tons, 140,000 pounds. And that is significantly more than uh, any of SpaceX competitors on the market. And I think it might even get close to rivaling the Saturn V rocket, which is what brought uh, the United States astronauts to the moon back in the 60s. So this thing has the potential to be a pretty big game changer. And I think no matter what happens with it, it's going to be interesting and worth checking out. So I wanted to get uh, your thoughts on that. I'm likely going to go anyhow. I'll probably do maybe two or three videos, depending on uh, how long it takes for them to get this thing off the ground. One of the problems with covering the space program and uh, commercial space efforts like this is that you never know when the rocket's actually going to launch. So sometimes you can go down and, and expect to spend a day or two, and then it takes a week or so to get the thing off the ground. So we'll keep an eye on this and I'll uh, let you know what I'm thinking. But I'd love to get your thoughts on doing this kind of stuff occasionally where we look at some piece of technology that isn't consumer related, but uh, really cool and I think uh, game changing kind of thing in some way. Another thing I'm thinking about and I'd love to get your thoughts on is Toy Fair, uh, which is taking place also next month in New York City. I get uh, you know PR contacts that uh, see if I'm ask me if I'm going to this fair and I never have went before because I don't cover toys necessarily but there's a lot of stuff at this show that might be of interest to you all so I'd like to just hear from you about whether or not I should go and if so the things that you'd like for me to find while I'm out at Toy Fair I, I probably would be looking at obviously technology related toys that maybe have some relevance for parents or perhaps relevance to us adults uh, so let me know down in the comments below and now it's time for some news, and this is a big one here that got leaked to Axios last night. Apparently, the national security team inside the Trump administration is considering a proposal to nationalize a 5G network here in the United States. And their uh, goal here is for the government to own the network backbone, the infrastructure, very similar to how the highway system works, for example. And then they would lease access to that network uh, through private service providers like AT&T and Verizon and Comcast and everybody else. And that is uh, kind of the big uh, proposal being laid out here. And their reasons for it uh, involve economics, but also national security. Uh, part of the issue they're claiming in this document that you can find linked on the uh, short URL there is that uh, the Department of Defense is having a hard time getting large volumes of data transmitted across to its facilities here in the United States. Uh, they're trying to get ahead of the Chinese for artificial intelligence, for example, and they need a constant data stream to get that done. They're having a hard time with that. They're concerned the Chinese are making greater advancements, not only in AI, but also in uh, developing 5G networks and infrastructure, and that they're also manufacturing a lot of the routing uh, hardware to do all of that, which in itself is another national security risk. Uh, they're also concerned about the fact that in rural areas here in the United States, they are uh, not only being displaced because of manufacturing leaving the country, but also because they don't have access to broadband at all. I've got one provider here, and at least I can run this business here, but in many parts of the country here in the U.S., because we are so spread out, uh, you can't run a YouTube channel even because you don't have the bandwidth to do it. And uh, certainly that is leaving a big portion of the country behind economically because they can't get access to the Internet as fast as I can. In addition to that, uh, the telecommunication companies were given the opportunity to build out rural broadband, took the money and didn't do it. Uh, so we've got a lot of compounding issues here that they think uh, makes a good case for the U.S. government owning the network that all these private providers can compete on. And this is something that uh, will be a uh, really controversial discussion over the next couple of weeks. It'll be interesting to see if it comes up in the State of the Union address. Now, inside of this document, which you can find at that link, uh, there's some possible industry reactions that these national security officials have uh, pondered in the course of developing this proposal. 
It looks as though AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile will probably have the most to win from this. Certainly, it gets more competitive for them. Uh, and they anticipate T-Mobile having the uh, most uh, willingness to support this kind of plan because they have the uh, least built out infrastructure here in the U.S. And uh, this might be good for these wireless providers to, again, get their infrastructure essentially for free and just pay for its usage based on who knows what. I'm sure their lobbyists will make it really in, you know, attractive for uh, those companies. Uh, Comcast and Charter they see being the losers in this because uh, this will actually provide broadband competition for areas where there's only one broadband provider. I'll show you an example of how 5G might work in a, a residential area, especially in a rural area in a second. And this could be a, a big problem for Comcast because you could go from having one choice of provider uh, to suddenly having four or five or more if smaller, more regional carriers can also uh, hop onto this network and sell services to customers. So it could be a very good thing from a competitive competitive standpoint uh, with the downside that the government actually runs the back end of the network. Um, they also kind of pontificated as to what Google might think about this and uh, they think they might just stay neutral or maybe even support it because it does allow them to sell more advertising in their words. So it does appear that for the most part a lot of these larger telecommunication companies do have a lot to gain here even though their markets get more competitive. They don't have to build the network, the taxpayers will do that. Uh, they probably will have to pay on a per user basis or something so their risk is reduced and on top of all of that uh, they also don't have to secure the network at least the overall infrastructure because the government here is claiming they're going to do it I don't know how this works I don't know what the ongoing costs of this are going to be there's always that discussion as to whether or not the government can do something as well as private enterprise can do but I think at least in the standpoint of broadband access here uh, we have not seen private industry provide it universally to the United States here to the point where again some parts of the country are severely economically disadvantaged and other parts Parts of the country do not have any choices uh, to get their uh, broadband access and I think to some degree that lack of choice has uh, kind of uh, prevented further development of broadband speed for many people so we'll see where this ends up Now, I did want to show you what this 5G technology looks like because it's not just a single thing it's a matter of getting uh, faster gigabit speeds to that last mile to customers homes and AT&T has been working on something that they have here in a uh, press release that you can find at that link about uh, using power line as part of the way to get that last mile accomplished and this is something that I think could be a big boom for uh, some of these rural networks that are really in dire need of being upgraded or even being created in the first place. And what they're proposing here is uh, developing these little tiny microcells that can be uh, put on essentially a telephone pole, an electrical pole, and be able to deliver broadband to mobile devices like these, but also provide gigabit to a home. You put a little antenna outside your house, you bring it into your house, hook it up to your network, and you've got gigabit back and forth to that telephone telephone pole, it backhauls to maybe a cell tower somewhere else through power lines and then it gets out via fiber to the greater network. And this is very inexpensive comparatively to build. You don't have all the local regulatory issues of having to put towers up everywhere. And uh, this is, I think, got a lot of potential because it's so easy to expand it and be able to make it all work. The problem here, though, is that you're dealing with a lot of bureaucracy and regulation to get this to work under the current uh, law because you have to have, first of all, the uh, pole access for uh, these little towers that you want to install. You have to work out something with your local electrical monopoly, which we have in most parts of the United States, to carry that data back. And there are a whole host of uh, obstacles that get in the way of making this happen very quickly. And I think this might be part of why the government is considering just taking it all over and then selling access to the network. So where am I at on this? Well, I am mixed at the moment just because we don't know enough about what this is beyond what has been leaked out of the Trump administration in a PowerPoint slide that was uh, taken with a smartphone camera. So this is certainly something they did not intend to get out this early. A lot of times within this administration, there are competing factions that leak stuff out to harm the other one. And already the FCC chair has come out against this proposal because he doesn't think it's a good idea. But I think there are parts of this that have some merit in the sense that consumers finally get some choice. If you're out in rural America right now with uh, nothing but a, a, a landline to get out to the internet, this suddenly not only gives you a broadband connection, but a choice of providers for that connection, which I think will 
uh, dramatically improve the prospects of having the economy recover in places that have been decimated over the loss of manufacturing. Having broadband access is really critical to being competitive now, and a lot of places in the country, millions and millions of people here, do not have that access. In other parts of the country, like where I live, I've got one provider. Uh, they can decide when to increase my speed or not, and I'm feeling a bit uh, constrained right now with only 10 megabits per second upstream. It's limiting some of the things that I can do, and if I live somewhere else, I'd have access maybe to more choice and greater speed. Uh, this levels the playing field out significantly because I will go from just Comcast to maybe having Comcast, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile uh, all sitting out at the telephone pole out there. And that is really attractive to me. And I think it might be something that uh, could greatly uh, expand consumer choice and to some degree negate this entire net neutrality argument altogether because we no longer have to worry about imposing all these regulations when there's enough competition to ensure that consumers will get uh, the best possible access given how competitive the market can become. Now, can the government build this in three years like they're proposing? I highly doubt it. Uh, they certainly haven't had a good track record of doing that in other types of projects that they've done. But uh, if you look at what the government did with the interstate highway system, which started under the Eisenhower administration, certainly that was a uh, infrastructure investment that benefited the country greatly, not only for the economy, but also for national security, which is some of the same arguments they're making here with uh, having the government own the backbone of our broadband infrastructure here in the U.S. And I'm glad this discussion is happening. I did not expect it out of this administration. And it could very well be that this leak came out of the fact that there are people in the administration that don't want to see it happen, which is why it's getting out so early. But I'm going to be watching the State of the Union address on Tuesday and see if this is part of what uh, President Trump talks about in his address, because this might actually be a good thing if it's done the right way. But I'm sure you all will have lots of opinions, which I expect you to leave down below in the comment stream. Looking forward to uh, talking about this a bit more and seeing where this develops as this uh, leak becomes a more broader policy, uh, policy perhaps that gets proposed in front of Congress. So stay tuned. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot about this in the coming months. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And our first question comes in here from Kobayashi Maru. Uh, that's a Star Trek reference if you watch Star Trek 2, the no-win situation. Well, Kobayashi has found a way to win when it comes to buying a computer because he was able to pick up a refurbished Dell here, an i7 with a fourth-generation processor and a warranty uh, for $610, including a 1080p touch display. That's a pretty good deal, and I definitely agree with this. If your budget is tight, I would go and look at some of the official refurbished stores that are out there from most of the major manufacturers. Uh, Dell here has got a bunch of computers that are running off lease that start at $179. Bucks. You could probably upgrade them to some degree or another as well with maybe more RAM and graphics cards after the fact. It's uh, almost like buying a bare bones kit, but you've got something that was factory recertified. Uh, the only issue I found with some of these Dells is that the warranty is only like 100 days on it. They do offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, though, so if something doesn't work out in the first 30 days, you can send it right back to them and get your money back. I really like what Apple's done with their refurbs over the years. In fact, I've bought uh, in my prior career a lot of refurbished Macs over the years because uh, you can buy usually the prior year models at a lower price and uh, they come with a full one-year warranty that I think are eligible for Apple Care as well. They don't come in a, an official box. You get them in these generic boxes for most of these manufacturers, but the factory itself was the one that recertified the computers for resale. And I have never had an issue with a refurbished Mac where I've had a lot of issues with ones that I've bought new. So uh, there you go. There's some really good opportunities there. But you do need to be careful because uh, anybody can really sell a uh, refurbished computer. They can say it's certified perhaps like this listing his here on Amazon, but you definitely want to look at the fine print. Check out whether or not it has a warranty before you buy it from uh, some other place because anybody, again, can buy some computer for parts and put it back together again, but you want to get something that I think has been uh, certified by the manufacturer or better uh, refurbished by the manufacturer itself and definitely keep an eye on what warranty is being provided to because you might have a computer that you get a good deal on, but if it only lasts six months and you have to buy another one after that or repair it, uh, you're not going to be saving all that much money. Now this next question came in in response to the Plex virtual reality thing that we had on the channel last week. 
Uh, that involved putting on the Google Daydream headset, watching a movie in virtual reality, and then inviting your friends who are not with you uh, in to watch in your virtual theater. You can have up to three people join you uh, for a total of four watching this. And uh, John Tierney here is wondering whether or not that's a copyright violation. And, you know, it's kind of a, a, a question that I think might have to get tested at some point. Uh, what I did do is some research about what constitutes a public performance, and I found a good explanation here uh, from Iona College and some advice they were giving to their own students about separating a public performance from a private one. And uh, the key phrase here is uh, a private performance is something that's shown to a normal circle of family and its social acquaintances. So you could make the argument that your social acquaintances here, even though they're joining you virtually, is not a public performance. You're not broadcasting this out via YouTube on a live stream, for example. It's something that's limited just to people that are on your friends list who you have let into your uh, little realm there to watch. So I don't think the uh, motion picture industry is going to spend a lot of time going after people to, that are doing this because I think it's questionable as to whether or not this actually is a public performance given that it's limited to just a uh, group of social acquaintances. So I think you're probably okay with this. Uh, Plex is fine either way because they're not the ones actually delivering the movie. Uh, you are through your own infrastructure. They're just providing the means to do it. You could easily share a movie that's not copyrighted either with uh, your friends as well. But I do think that uh, what Plex is doing with this is not a public performance and therefore uh, not an issue for copyright. But of course, I am not a lawyer. So uh, definitely seek your own legal advice if you are concerned about that question. And this last question comes in from Stacy Luster. It's actually more of a rant, but I wanted to talk about it and maybe generate some discussion in our comment thread about this one too. Uh, computers are getting very thin and light, and uh, more often than not now, they're getting to be fanless as well, which means they heat up a lot more. And Stacy's concerned that this might uh, do some damage to their long-term durability, given that these components are heating up more than they used to because there are no fans on board to cool them off, and uh, therefore your laptops might break more frequently. And that certainly is a concern, I would say. And I think part of the problem is, is that PC manufacturers now are trying to compete against mobile devices because... For a lot of casual users, uh, they don't need a computer at all. Oftentimes an iPad or even just a mobile phone uh, is enough for them. And of course that uh, is an issue for people trying to sell PCs to folks. So they've been trying to make PCs more like tablets, thin and light, uh, like uh, many of the ones that we've looked at recently, especially the two-in-ones. And uh, that is certainly a problem. Uh, one thing he does mention though, is he's got a Mac that has lasted him a long time, a late 2009 iMac. And it was funny because this reminded me of the computer that uh, Corey is currently using to edit video here on the channel. Uh, that computer I bought in probably May or June of uh, 2012. We're now almost six years later and that thing is still working and it's been running hot ever since I got it because I'm always editing video on it. I was using it as my uh, daily driver at work. So that computer for a good length of its lifespan was probably running 14, 15 hours a day of doing work on it. And uh, it's been holding up quite well. We have it hooked up to an external monitor right now. Uh, the only problem we've got is that three of the keys on the keyboard don't work all that great, but the rest of the computer is fine. It does get bogged down with 4K video, of course. That's not because of its age. It's just that its processor wasn't designed to work on that kind of video. But uh, by and large, that was money well spent six and a half years ago. And I think this computer that he's using over there holds the record for uh, my longest running uh, work computer ever. It think, the thing just keeps going. And I've been pretty pleased with its, uh, with its outcome so far. So we'll see how long it lasts. I'll let you know when it dies. And now it's time for a Q&A for you. And speaking of virtual reality, I've been noticing whenever I do a VR video that there's not a lot of enthusiasm for VR. This includes just the subscriber base here, but also over time. One of the things I've been able to uh, discern over the years is how popular a product is based on the long-term views I get on something I review. Because as you know, uh, search generates a ton of viewership here on the channel and uh, things that are really out there in the consumer's mind are the things that receive a lot of traffic and my VR videos typically don't. And I'm just wondering why VR isn't moving along faster as far as consumer adoption is concerned. It's really cool, uh, but I'm just wondering why so many people aren't getting into it. Is it the cost? Is it the fact that you gotta put on these headsets? Is it the motion sickness and eye strain? Uh, if you haven't yet adopted VR and don't plan on using it at all, let me know down in the comments. I'd like to know uh, your thoughts on virtual reality and its development. Our channel of the week this week is the Slow Mo Guys. You might have seen them before, and they've got a great video that you'll find at the link down there. 
uh, which will take you to how a TV works in slow motion. And not only did they do a TV in slow motion, uh, they zoomed in on the pixels of it, and you can see how an LED set works as well as how uh, a CRT set works, and they also grabbed an OLED display too. So you can see what these TVs are doing uh, close up, slowed way down, uh, which is really pretty remarkable actually when you look at uh, what is actually going on inside the television. I think you all might enjoy that quite a bit. So this week on the channel, we've got a couple of things coming up. The first is a sponsored post that I'm doing for Kensington. And this one is one that I think will add some value because uh, you will be able to see uh, some choices of docking stations for your computer. And I've got one for just about every particular use case you might have. And I think it might be helpful as you're looking at docks to make a great decision about which dock to choose. And it's relevant just beyond uh, Kensington's products as well. So that will be coming up probably tomorrow. I also got in this network attached storage device from TerraMaster. I wasn't crazy about these in the past, but what I have uh, found intriguing about this one is that it has an Intel processor. It's basically equipped the same way as my uh, high-end WD MyCloud PR2100 that I've got in the closet there. Uh, but this one costs a lot less. I think it's like two or 300 bucks with four gigs of RAM uh, and that Intel processor. So we'll see how it does as a Plex server, which is uh, my primary objective with that one. I also ordered the Mavic Air. Uh, that is the new pocketable uh, drone from DJI, but delivers 4K 100 megabits per second video at 30 frames per second, unfortunately. Uh, but otherwise, looks like a pretty complete drone that I think might be a nice replacement for my Phantom 4 that I haven't really used all that much because it's so much to lug around. This thing is a lot smaller, and I'm going to see if I end up using my drones more now that I have something that's portable and delivers what I hope will be the same image quality. So that hopefully will be coming up later in the week. I think it comes in on Wednesday. I'm putting up the Newton here again because I'm just trying to get to it, but I just haven't gotten there yet. I will do this Newton, though, at some point. I'm really eager to share that retro review with you, but we've got a lot of stuff coming up that I want to make sure we get out first for current technology before we roll back to uh, the old stuff. It's also possible, too, we might have a sponsored post from uh, Nokia later in the week as well, where I'm going to talk about uh, my weight loss, because you, you all haven't seen me when I was heavier, but I used to weigh about 185 to 200 pounds, and I uh, lost about 40 pounds or so and kept it off, and I'm going to show you how I've used technology to help me do that. Uh, that'll also be coming up a little later in the week. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to my support page at lon.tv support to make a one-time or monthly contribution to the channel. We also have our ongoing relationship with Plex. You can get a free Plex account at lon.tv slash Plex. No credit card required. Uh, when you're ready to step up to their uh, beefier plan, the Plex Pass, you can do that right there, and we'll get a commission for that. And you can also gift a Plex Pass subscription to somebody at lon.tv slash Plex gift. We've also got some other channels you can follow me on. We've got the Extras channel where I unbox stuff. I'll be doing that uh, TerraMaster NAS in a few minutes. We also have a podcast feed where you can get audio versions of this show and some other stuff that I'm doing. Uh, we also have the Snippets channel at lon.tv slash snippets that offers smaller chunks of this and other videos. And my live streams are archived at lon.tv slash live streams. And we're hoping to get some more live streams going soon. I do ask if you like what I'm doing to click on that notification bell so you'll get notified whenever I've got anything going on. You can do that on all of my channels, so definitely check out that little bell there. You can engage with the channel through my email list at lon.tv slash email. My Facebook page is at lon.tv slash Facebook, where I post stuff all the time. And we've got the store at lon.tv slash store. And if you want to know when I add things to the store, you can get a store alert by going to lon.tv slash store alert. And the store is where I sell the items that I've reviewed on the channel and I'm now getting rid of. And you can usually get them uh, fairly close to new for a lower price than they are new. And right now I've got that Phantom 4 that I just put up on there. So if you are looking for a drone, uh, check it out. That's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. I want to thank everyone for your continued support of the channel, whether it's contributing, whether it's watching, whether it's commenting. All of that stuff together uh, has been greatly appreciated. I want to thank everyone for almost a year of uh, being able to sustain this business on its own, and I uh, greatly appreciate you all every single day. Please keep those questions and suggestions coming on uh, down below in the comment stream. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters, the Black Eyed and Blues Music Hour podcast, Chris Allegretta, Steve Blixt, Stanley Taub, and Kalyan Kumar.
If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.